So, so it's this, it's down here, right? The parameters are required to permit. It's only the to do it. It's too much. Well, Still, 
How's the project going? Can we talk about the macros? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, for the bonus points, um, are you done with the project? Okay, so you're going to the bonus points, right? Yeah. Uh, I. Reply your question um, about yeah yeah the specifics I'm... of the macro. Uh, the big chunk of the bonus is actually changing the interpreter, right? Because the lexical part is just adding extra symbols, right? Tokens. The syntax analyzer, you just need to. Uh, look at the, the grammar, uh, the production that you need to add, and uh, from the interpreter, uh, to be honest, uh, usually when I propose bonus or any extra work, I do it myself in order to uh, foresee any problems you may have, any questions you may have. For this particular bonus, you're the first student that is actually trying. Nobody asked me about how to specific the macro. So this week, and I, I plan on doing myself uh, the bonus. So give myself some bonus, and uh, after that, maybe we can talk about it. But I, I don't know the specifics. For example, I can't clarify if you interested in doing that part, uh, clarify which production you need to add in the grammar so we will be all used in the same page because you have to go to the documentation. There isn't just one place, right? Um, this actually, uh, the guy who uh, created mouse, uh, he didn't have uh, macro as an extension that was added later by someone else. So I have to make sure that uh, there is a clear specification for how the mac macro should be uh, added. Uh, I, I what I what can I say? I, I will get back to you, okay? Because honestly, I haven't looked because it's it, the first time someone is trying to do it. Well, the thing I was curious about was um, if you look at when the lexical analyzer gets the input, if you can just substitute all of the different macro calls with the actual macro body, like the function body, but then, but then you would be, you would, you're planning on doing that in the lexical analyzer. Yeah, before you even start tokenizing, because then everything already, you can keep everything else the same. Then, right? We just have yeah, but uh, then you wouldn't be technically doing much, right? I mean, it's still a lot of string manipulation that yeah, you have to do. But I I would prefer you not to do that because okay. it's it it takes uh, out the fun, right? <laughs> I, I I would. I was going to say you're kind of cheating, but that was too harsh. So I. But like, isn't that how C header files work? It just like literally copies code and pastes it yeah, in. Yeah, but header files, uh, that's like pre-processing directives. Usually they're, they do those substitutions. But that's the actual code. You're, 
I understand. I understand that that's that's actually clever uh, what you're trying to do. But I, I was hoping that you guys would actually would have to change the interpreter and actually do stuff. Okay. okay. He's just using the right. software as a service. It's smart. Yeah, I think it's really smart. Yeah, you're trying to get the job done, right? But here is not this naked academic is not just to get it done, but actually learn, right? So, yeah, I I see what you're, you're saying and trying to do. It's actually smart just to replace, but I would prefer if you don't do that for the amount of points that I'm giving. How much points? How many points? Uh, I think it's 10. And what? It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know. Uh, uh, we have any others here that are trying to do the macro yet? Um, comments? That's a uh, very easy five points, right? Those are easy five points. Uh, assuming that most of you will try that, that's really easy. And that's something you can do in the Lex on a live. I have a question. Uh, Last class, I thought you mentioned briefly that you could work with a partner, but that wasn't mentioned on the sheet. Yeah, you can work with a partner, just okay. one, so groups of two, and uh, just one of you needs to submit. But make sure you have uh, both names in the comments se session sections. Any other questions related to the project? Good. Um, so last time uh, we were talking about binding, uh, which in general terms, basically binding refers to an association between two things. Uh, and in PPL, we're most most mostly concerned about variable bindings uh, and of course you have variable and the name uh, but uh, the ones we're particularly interested um, are variable and type so that's called the type binding variable in memory stores binding where the variable will be allocated in memory and when is the variable visible? Uh, so that's uh, the scope binding. The type binding, so and binding can also be static or dynamic, depending whether you are able to change the binding uh, after the your program starts uh, running. So we have static binding or dynamic binding. Uh, we discussed type binding. Uh, some, if you say this programming language uh, uses static uh, type binding or dynamic type binding. What does that mean? You guys remember the difference between static type binding, dynamic type binding? Can someone explain the difference? Letitia? Um. Static type binding is like when you declare that you're creating an int uh, and then it's just int forever. Dynamic type binding is you just say x equals 10 and it says, oh, that's an int, but then if you said x equals hello, you'd be like, oh, it's a string now. So uh, dynamic type binding, language like Python, for example, allows you to do as you're saying. You assign 10 to a variable. Uh, this is called the implicit uh, typing, right? Uh, based on the value or, or type inference, right? The, the type is inferred based on the value being assigned to the variable, right? That's one way to do the dynamic type line, right? Uh, yeah, and then you assign a string, then uh, the type of the variable, the binding changes. 
Uh, and we had a brief discussion about the pros and cons of dynamic and static or static type binding. Which one is more produces a code that tends to be more reliable? Static or dynamic type binding? Static. Static, right? Uh, you use the compiler uh, as your ally because the compiler will check, right, if you are using the variable according to the type correctly, right? Uh, in different contexts, you, the compiler can check whether, okay, in this expression, this variable that you're using as a string is actually a string. So those checkings uh, uh, help to produce a code that is more reliable. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, dynamic type binding gives the programmer lots of freedom and allows uh, uh, experimentation, right? So it's great for prototyping. Uh, when for, I mentioned that uh, for um, data mining, uh, where you usually you're trying to uh, explore the data, uh, that you have and dynamic type binding a uh, language like Python, um, they, they're a great fit for those type of applications that require a lot of flexibility and uh, last time uh, you guys also mentioned that if your code is uh, substance, substantively larger, uh, you usually prefer something that is more predictable, uh, use static, but this is a short code, it's just a script, you try to uh, experiment some, uh, do some data exploration, for example, uh, dynamic type binding fits uh, really well for those type of applications. And uh, there's a cost for dynamic type binding, uh, usually the programming language that have dynamic type binding, they are uh, implemented using interpreters, uh, and uh, that impacts, of course, the execution time. Nothing in life comes without a price, right? You always have to pay, especially in computer science. You always have to put things in, in balance and evaluate what's your best choice. Yeah. You, you, you can never uh, get a situation that is perfect. You always have to compromise uh, something. And then we switch to storage binding. Uh, so that's uh, when you say storage, we're talking about the memory. Uh, and storage binding refers to the allocation and deallocation process, freeing the memory. And the binding refers to where this variable will be allocated. When we think about that, we need to look at, when, uh, of course, uh, memory uh, is going to be uh, something related to an execution process. Sorry process uh, that your program is executing. So it's a running program, a process, and uh, the operating system uh, will load your, your, your program uh, instructions and uh, it will use a process data structure that varies depending on the operating system and to organize uh, how the your program will run. So there's a, a segment of a process that is that contains the instructions that the text area and all the others refer to. Uh, those are important for storage binding. For, for example, this area in green here called BSS. Uh, I forgot the acronym for BSS, but uh, that's the area that uh, global variables and static variables, they will be allocated in this area, right? Uh, so uh, the distinction here is that a global variable has a 
global scope, uh, usually the scope is defined by the, your, the, your program. So the variable usually has a very long lifetime, is created in the beginning, and usually it will be available throughout your program and program's execution. And then you have static variables, which are variables that they will have, usually they have a limited scope, Usually the scope can be a class scope, the object oriented programming languages, or it can be a function or a procedure scope. Because you can create static variables in difference of a traditional local variable and a static variable is that the, the value of those static variables are retained between function calls. So Sometimes this is a feature that you want. Uh, for example, if you want your a procedure or function to know how many times it's being called, that's a perfect case for uh, a static local variable, which is a fine static local variable. Uh, but uh, mo uh, in most cases, you guys are probably more familiar with static in the context of uh, static uh, class variables, right? Uh, variables that are associated with uh, a class, not with each specific instance of your class. So those variables, uh, class variables or global variables, they will be in this PSS there. Uh, and then we have an area for dynamic allocated uh, uh, variables. Uh, so, for example, in the, the this area here in blue, that's called the heap. That's the area used for dynamic allocated variables. So, if you instantiate uh, an object, and this object defines, uh, let's say, three instance variables. Let's say ID, name, and salary, right? an employee class and you have uh, you instantiate an object of employee type. So this whole uh, object uh, will be allocated in the heap and all these instance variables will be part of the data structure of this object. So it will be physically in the heap. Don't be confused about uh, confused with instance variables, they are physically in the heap, and a reference variable. The reference variable might be a local variable and within a function, for example, and those will be allocated in the stack. So if it, usually if it's a local variable, uh, reference variables, uh, uh, or um, built-in type variables, they will be usually allocated in the stack. So for each function call, uh, and I, when I say function, I think about any procedure that you're going to make a call, usually passing parameters and having a return value. It can be in object-oriented programming language, it might be a method, but in other languages, it might be just a regular function. Uh, so variables defined within the scope of those functions, they uh, they need to be associated with the context of that function. So that's why they will be saved in the stack frame. Every time you make a function call, remember remember that uh, video that I show at the end of uh, last class on Tuesday. Uh, every time you make a function call, a stack frame is pushed. Uh, onto the, the call stack and all the context associated with that function uh, will be part of the stack frame, including all the variables created, the local variables created within the function. So uh, those are the three storage binders we should uh, discuss. And again, uh, this is more important if you are thinking about actually 
uh, implementing a programming language, although it's important to understand where the variables you define in your program as a as a computer scientist or developer, it, it's important to understand where those variables will sit in memory, just to have a general understanding of uh, where things or how things happen behind the scene, right? Uh, but uh, of course, if you're implementing a programming language, you have to have a deeper and deeper understanding of where those variables will be allocated because you need to specify those things. Uh, uh, make sure you, you um, allocate those variables correctly. Uh, so, so basically, uh, you have these three types. So you have static and global variables because they will be in the BSS segment. Stack allocated variables, as the name suggests, allocated in the stack frame. Uh, in the call stack, uh, in the stack frames, in the call stack, and heap allocated variables. Those are dynamic uh, allocated variables. We talked about the pros and cons of global variables, right? Uh, usually, uh, my recommendation is just use global variables if you define them as constants. So we saw those examples. Uh, so let's take a look at this code here. This is called in Java. You have X, for example, is uh, because of the static keyword here, we know that X is associated with the class. It's not associated with each instance uh, uh, created from example from this class. So X will be allocated in that BSS area. How about variable Y? Where do you think variable Y will be allocated? Variable y is a parameter, right? Stack. Stack, right? It's a local variable uh, within the context of the function call function. So that's will be allocated in the stack. And uh, here we're using uh, the static variable x. Now let's look at this other function here, main args. Stack two, right? Stack two. Uh, ex. Okay, so that's the the uh, source of confusion. Just because ex is a reference variable, it doesn't mean that ex is dynamically allocated. So let's clarify this right away. Um, so what's going to happen is we're going to have so let's say let's say this is BSS at the text and then you have this is the heat. have the call stack. Okay, so uh, program started. Uh, you have a uh, main, right? This is the stack frame for the main function, the main function was called. Then we have args, right? So args is right here. Okay. Args is an array. You guys know that an array in Java is a reference variable, right? 
So, what's the value of arcs? It's a memory, right? Address that points. That's why it's a reference variable. Reference variable, the value of a reference variable is an address. That address points to some array that is allocated in the heap, right? So the array itself is in the heap, but the arts variable, reference variable, is in the stack. You guys see the difference here? The same for ex, right? Ex is a reference variable of type example, right? So the value of the X is just an address, right? Now let's say that the example object, this guy here is the example object. Example object, the new, right? The new example object will be, will occupy some space in the heap, right? And the address where this uh, object begins, right, the start address of this whole object here of example type is this value here, right? So the variable ex, if I ask variable ex, it's a reference variable, but because this variable is, was created within the main function, it's a local variable within the main function. And the value is just a reference variable that points to some object that was uh, allocated in memory. Okay? See the distinction? Yeah. So would stack allocated normally mean that it's just a reference variable that points to an address, and then the object itself that that's what's in the heap? Exactly. But let's let's change this a little bit. Let's say I created. So let's consider a student object. Example only has a static uh, variable. Let's say there is a student object with ID uh, of type int and then string of type uh, name of type string. Okay, so it's a it's an object that has instance variables. Okay, so look at the difference. Let's say I in main. Let's say I do this in main student. Students s equals to new students five you know. okay so this new student here is going to be another object let's say it's going to be allocated right here this is the student object okay inside the student object at some point there is a variable ID. There is a variable name. OK? Because those are instance variables, right? They are associated with the object. So they're part of the object data structure, right? So this student S, this S variable, it was created in main. It's also here in the stack frame of main, right? S points to this object here, right? So S was stack allocated, right? Just like ex, okay? Stack, stack allocated. What about these variables, ID and name? They're physically in the heap, right? So they, those instance variables, they are allocated in the heap because they are part of the object structure that resides in the heap. Okay? And yeah. the only way to access ID or name would be to call it on the student variable? Yeah, you have to use this reference variable to get to this starting address of this object. And then from there, when you do dot ID, uh, it knows how to get this ID value, right? If you don't have this reference, you can't access then you have all sort of problems, right? Okay. Yeah. So even with like uh, like a non-object oriented language like C or something like that, if you have these different structures, same kind of thing is going on. Yes, because in C, 
uh, you can also dynamically allo allocate things, right? You can uh, dynamically allocate an array, right? So you can create that data structure or you can do dynamic allocation of a struct that is very similar to an object, except doesn't have uh, methods, but it's, it's very similar. What about variable Z? <coughs> Stack, right? Oh, I have the student here. I forgot. Exact the same. Who created those slides? <laughs> exact the same example that I was thinking. Okay, so we have ID and name for students, and we have the same example of stuff. What's the name there? It's not Zach, right? Joe. Yeah. yeah. At least I did something different. <laughs> so as you can see, ST, right, is stack allocated, but the object here will be will reside in the heap, and those instance variables ID and name. ID is a built-in type uh, ints here. Name is a reference variable. These variables will physically reside in the heap, so they're heap allocated. Okay. Uh, this is the same using an example in Python. All right, so in Python, to define instance variable, you prefix with self, right? So self ID and self name, those are instance variables. So it's the same example written in Python. So before we go to scope, let's practice. Uh, open uh, in class activity, storage binding. I have it open yeah, here. So activity 10, why don't you guys take a few minutes and do activity 10. On here. So the the name uh, the numbers are super small. Those are so I recommend you to just put uh, you can put a comma and then the letter. Okay. So for each of these variables referred by the numbers. I want you to classify or say where those variables are allocated. ESS, stack, or E. I'll give you guys some time to do. Well, I, I can send it out. <laughs> I didn't send it yet. No, um, they said that they will provide me. Uh, you can wait. Yeah, Shoot me a message.
Yeah, I always forget. That's good. Ooh. ESS data segments. It's called basic service set. Now, okay, what is it? Trust you. That's not that. <laughs> I found a lot of weird stuff. But <laughs> starting symbol sounds right. Anything starting with BS can't be good. They always say the ESS segment, but it doesn't tell what it is. <laughs> so it's next. I guess it's block starting symbol. I don't know. I'm not convinced. This is more important if you're implementing an operating system or doing very low level stuff. Okay. You guys done? 
No. You guys were just spending the whole time searching for what is BS. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's returning to a value that it just throws on the stack and then you call this address later. You're not creating like you're not creating some value. Okay, so number one. A, B, or C? C, B. C, right? Number two, C as well. Number three. A. Agree. Number four. B. B. Five. B, right? Careful with five. You think it's oh, it's a, it's an object. No, but it's that's not an instance variable. That's a reference variable created inside this method. So it's B. Okay. Good. Six. B, right? Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. A, right? Yeah, actor. System dot out. So out is a static verb, right? You didn't have to instantiate uh, out, right? Well, system, system. System dot out. Out is a static variable in system, right? So you didn't have to instantiate system to use out. But that static variable out uh, points, right, to an object that represents the standard output. Uh, I think it's a uh, Output stream. I don't know exactly what type of object, but uh, at some moment during uh, the load of your Java program, the virtual machine created that uh, output stream object in the right? And save that reference. And whenever you do system dot out, it knows that. Uh, which object to use to uh, run those methods like print line and so on. It's the object print stream. Object print stream. There you go. Okay, you guys are okay with uh, star refining? Dominated? Those are great for midterm questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> Easy points, right? So let's talk about scope. Um, the scope of a variable determines if uh, a variable is visible or not within different contexts, and those uh, 
when you say visible, it means uh, if the variable can be referenced, re uh, read, or assigned, written in that state. Uh, well, sometimes you can't assign, right? So this statement is kind of misleading because it might be the variable might be in scope, but it's a constant, so you can't assign. Or maybe you don't have uh, right permissions on that variable. But anyway, uh, scope can be global. Um, so it, it's available, the variable is visible or available uh, in any context, pretty much. Module, if the variable is only available within the scope of, of a module or a file, right? You can think of a module as a file uh, context or a function. When we say function here, think uh, just a name procedure, so that can also be a method or a block, right? Because you can define uh, uh, scope within a function. Like a while construct, you define a scope uh, to, right? Or an if statement. So most programming languages allow variables to have global scope. Uh, you can see those examples there. Uh, you can do that in Java, right? In Java, you can't define that global scope. You can't. I guess you can uh, define a static variable, right? Uh, putting public public static variable. That's the uh, largest scope you can define in Java, right? But all these verb, uh, programming languages here allow you to define variables outside functions, including by So uh, typically, variables defined inside functions or blocks, they have local scope uh, within those blocks. Sometimes a local variable, that's the, an example that I showed uh, before, uh, a situation where a local variable, because, of, because you're using the same name, it might uh, hide a global variable. So you have to be careful, but uh, programming language uh, provide uh, mechanisms for disambiguation uh, using global in Python in C++. There's this operator called scope operator. Right? Uh, I'm seeing C++ here. Did you guys hear that there's a, a, a professor here? Um, I think he was recently hired, uh, a Jeff professor that is doing C++ in 1030. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, I'm working to be as LA. Are you uh, getting? I, I'm asking. working to be as LA, but yeah. Oh, he's really LA. Very yeah. interesting. Is, 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 he, is, is, he, is he is the first semester, I believe? I believe so. Yeah, yeah so it would, uh, in between us, it created a big commotion in <laughs> and uh, I guess uh, we were pretty advanced in the semester, right? And this was only detected now, and you have to change it. I guess it's going to switch to Java. So I don't know what you heard. Is, are you guys going to do Java? You heard about that? I'm not sure yet. Yeah. So I think that's what's going to happen. Um, That'd be really hard. The students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, we're doing Java. We're doing C++. We're doing yeah. Java. Yeah. 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 It's 1050. It's 1050. Oh, no. 1050. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was 1030. So. That doesn't make slightly more sense. Yeah. Right. yeah, so 1050, right? I'm not sure if we picked up any 1030 courses. I think it's just 1050. So you can talk to a couple of things. 
such an important course. I uh, feel really sorry for those students, especially uh, some of these students are probably having their first uh, programming class, right? Because if, if they had programming in high school, they would probably jump to Trinity 50, right? Uh, but yeah, I feel sorry for them. So probably uh, since you're the LA, ask them about, oh, how about the scope of greater in C++? Can you explain me before we, we move to Java? And this was an interesting story. Uh, I think, I, yeah, I was in my, finishing my master's degree. And, uh, yeah, I, I had a, some experience with C, and but mostly uh, I was using Java. And uh, there was this interview with Microsoft. So it was a big deal. The department said, hey, let's, you all need to apply. It's a great opportunity. And uh, the, the first round of interviews uh, were by phone. Of course, at that time, it was Skype here and stuff like that. So it's like phone, actually. You can see the person. Uh, and, and, and they said, no, it's going to be in C++. C++. <laughs> it's like, I, I have no, I, no clue. I, my experience was in Java. So I got a book, and it was like one week. Uh, more. And I got a book, started studying C++, and, and I remember like, that scope operator because the, the person that I was interviewing, after the first few questions, uh, I was super nervous, and I, I figured out that the, the person wasn't technical at all. Was, this person was reading the questions. <laughs> so, asked me about virtual methods. That was one of the questions. There was this question about the scope, and I guess I I was able to pass this first phase, right? Um, but um, it was like tricking the person on the other side to think that I was in, uh, experienced in C++ and I had only like a few days reading manuals and, and no uh, hands-on experience at all. The second phase was uh, they actually uh, uh, they were doing that for Latin, uh, South America, so all the interviews were in, in Buenos Aires. So Microsoft paid me to go to Buenos Aires after I barely passed this phone interview. They they sent me to Buenos Aires. I went there, did the interview the next day, and came back. So I did some. Of course, I didn't get the job, but I got to visit and, and see a little bit of Buenos Aires. <laughs> but, uh, got something out of it. Yeah, I got something out of it. The moral story is fake it till you make it. Yeah. Make it a beauty free trip out there. <laughs> Nowadays, these, these things are totally inconceivable, right? Because with remote uh, meetings, right? Why Microsoft would pay? someone to fly uh, in entry level, right? I was entry level to fly internationally. So you see the demand, demand at that time for developers was so high that for Microsoft, there was nothing, right? Because they couldn't find people to work with them. They still, anyway. they still do that, not currently because of COVID, but that's still the practice for the second company. Still, right? Tech high companies, they still, uh, they still were doing that. But I think COVID might change. COVID changed it, yeah. Even when COVID is over, they will think, well, we have the tools, so why right? we can uh, use those tools and evaluate the candidates without having to fly them, right? Yeah. But anyway. And the, I was really uh, stressed by the way they did the interview. I didn't do a good experience. I don't, I guess I don't work really well under pressure. It was like those, uh, you, you talk to someone probably five minutes and then you go to another room 
five minutes, go to another room. And sometimes it's someone from HR, someone tech, or someone, uh, I don't know, psychology. It was, <laughs> it was really stressful. And you had to, uh, of course, my English level at the time wasn't great. So I probably I was feeling that I was being observed on that aspect as well. It was like uh, a lot of stress going and, and they put you uh, in the room with all the other candidates and uh, people from other countries. You get that uh, uh, feeling, uh, do I belong here? Am I good enough? And the the self-esteem and, right, uh, and all those things. Uh, anyway, at the end, I. I didn't perform really well. And it was those things that they had the whiteboard, uh, here's the problem, solve it. And they were observing you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't do well, really well. <laughs> Not well at all. So anyway, I was just, uh, I was talking about C++. So since then, then I hate C++. <laughs> So anyway, blocks, uh, section of code, um, just saying how you define those uh, blocks, right? What else? Oh, nested subprograms. Sub so it's the idea of having nested functions. So that's, that's a feature that you don't see in many programming languages, but it's becoming more common. Uh, the ability to create functions within functions. So if you have a function that is doing a lot of things and perhaps uh, you want to create helper functions for your function, right? So you can create those levels. Uh, and those, usually those functions. Uh, so that's, that's interesting because uh, when basically when you talk about scope, most of the times we're thinking about variables, but in this case, we're talking about scope visibility of a function, right? Because this helper function is not going to be available outside, right? It's only available internally. So the scope of the function is more limited. Uh, Python has that, Scala has that as well. So I have an example, here it is, okay? so. So look at that, uh, you have the function called function, and this function has uh, other functions defined within. Is even and is odd, those are the functions, and this part here is actually the actual function code, okay? So the function is checking, Who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> if it's even and it's odd. Oh, but the, the, the parameters are different. Okay, okay. I was reading like, how can it be even and odd? <laughs> uh, okay, so you have two values actually, X and Y, right? So if it's nonsense uh, here, right? Is X is even and Y is odd, you return uh, X plus Y. Otherwise, you return x minus y. But within main, you can't access these internal functions. So the, the functions it's, uh, themselves, they have limited scope. We need to do that for the, for the extra credit, like nested macros. You're still thinking about those points? <laughs> I want those points. Uh, I I don't know. I don't. I as I said, I I haven't uh, done myself, so I don't know how hard it is. I can check it's hard this weekend. It's hard. <laughs> it's I bet it's it is, hard. right? It's, yeah, it's yeah, pretty rough it's either way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, the the if and the while, they can be nested, right? Uh, so I don't think the implementation was difficult. If you're thinking about the implementation of recursive. Well, for the while and the if, uh, it wasn't difficult because you just made a, I just made a recursive call to the code that interpret the 
the while and the if uh, constructs. But for, yeah, I understand you, you have to create some sort of call stack, right? Yeah, because you have function calls, so maybe you skip that and allow just one level of direction. Simplify, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the same example, but in Scala. So Scala has this ability that we don't have in Java, right? Or do we have in Java? Java is always changing. I don't know if they added <laughs> support for nested methods. Maybe you guys can Google and clarify that. Someone can do that. But uh, Scala has this uh, feature. I tested here. This is the same example uh, of nested functions in Scala. OK, we discuss uh, Static typing and dynamic typing. Let's talk about now static scope and dynamic scope. So the static scope is known at completion time and is determined based on the block where the variable is defined. Okay, so the static scope is uh, an easy way to understand static scope or static scoping is you have to look at the spatial relationship between functions. The actual, so if you have one level of scope and then you have another level that spatially encompasses the other scope, so you can, the inner scope can see the outer scope. So it's a, the relationship is spatial. For dynamic scope is based on the order of the function calls. So it's, it's much harder to understand uh, and more difficult to implement, right? Compared to the dynamic scope. So let's uh, take a look at this example. Uh, you have the fun, right, function, defines the super large scope, okay? And you have this definition here, A, B, and C, okay? And then uh, the question is, so, and then the function has the while construct that defines another scope, and you have this inner while uh, block, right? So the question is at one, right, at this point here, what are the variables do you think that are visible? For example, can we see A, B, and C? Yes, right, because static scope, you look at the spatial relationship between the scopes. So because A was defined in the outer scope, the inner scope can C or access variable A. What about variable B? In which variable B? Because we have variable B in this scope here. We also have another variable B, right? So at one, which variable B I'm, I'm accessing? The one in definition two, right? So because they use the same name, right? This one uh, in Definition two is the one that's going to be used here at this point. Variable C, the same thing, right? It's, it's variable sh uh, shading, right? Uh, variable C here is another variable and takes the precedence uh, because the, the static scope resolution works like first it looks at the current scope. If it can't if uh, the definition can't be find, found, it goes one level up, right? In the upper uh, levels of scope. Variable D, local here, right? Okay, so, and then we have this inner while loop, variable C. First of all, let's do it in order. 
at this level here, can we see variable A? Yes, right? And it's from definition one. Variable B. Definition two. Variable C. Definition three. D. Definition three. And E. Definition three. Okay? All right. So, static scope is easy to understand. It's the scope that we're more comfortable with. Uh, easy to interpret. Well, let's go to the dynamic scope. So, dynamic scope will look for local declarations first, okay, within the local scope. If that fails, look for declarations on the dynamic calling parent. What does that mean? Who called the function? Okay, so it's not about the spatial scope like we were seeing in the static scope. It's about the chain of function calls. Uh, that's the important thing that you should look at. So it's based on the calling sequence of subprograms, not their spatial relationship to each other. Because of that, uh, of course, you can run the same program and have different functions being called, right? Depending on the, the context, inputs of your program, how your program works. So the scope, that's why we say that the scope is dynamic, because it can only be determined when you run the program. So say, some people say that it provides more flexibility, uh, but it's, it's just harder to read. Okay? So if it's harder to read, the code is less reliable. There's more room for mistakes. Uh, in, let's take a look here. Dynamic scoping in JavaScript. So let's uh, let's start with this, right? So big was called, and okay, so big was called, and you have two functions within big. So we have variable x. Okay, so we need to keep track. So I'm gonna write it down. Big, right? variable x 3 okay and then we have a call to sub 1 so who call sub 1 was big right sub 1 sub 1 has another definition for x so then it has its own x and the value is set console console log x so What's the value that's going to be printed out? Seven, right? Because it's based on the local scope, right? So that's easy. So uh, that was that was it. This other one, uh, again, we started with big X defining three, but we now we're going to call sub two. The problem is sub two does not define x, right? So it's going to use x, and the value that's going to be displayed is three. This wasn't a good example because the static scope would have done the same, right? See if there's a better example. Uh, I think the, the example more interesting is in the activity. So let's open activity 11, please.
hopefully it's not the same numbers, right? No, it's this big. What value of x is displayed if function sub one in function sub one, right? That's the only document writes or output we have. Let's consider static scoping first. Okay. So let's do static scoping. We have uh, the initial function being called and x is five. Right? Because it's static scoping, I don't need to keep track of the function calls. So let's just evaluate. So x is five, we call sub two. Sub two. Uh, before we do that, let's uh, look at why do we have these bar. Oops. So JavaScript has uh, two variable modifiers that are related to scope. Okay, so when you declare a variable in JavaScript using bar, you're saying that the scope is the function, regardless of which specific block uh, where the variable was defined. Okay, so var is saying that I don't care which specific scope you're defining this variable. The scope is going to be the function, right? Um, Right? Even for example, if you have a function and then you have a while loop and you define var, uh, a variable within that while loop using var, it doesn't matter. The scope is the function. Okay? Let. Let is the specific scope, okay? It's the block where the variable is defined. So if I define a variable using let within a while loop, the scope is the while loop construct. Okay? It's not the function. Okay, so because we have uh, this function is not defined within any other function, var here, var or lets, it, it really wouldn't matter here uh, because it's been defined within the function anyway. Uh, so we have sub two. Uh, x, uh, x is 10. So just understand that this is a new x, right? It's not the same of this global x. You guys see that, right? If I wanted to use the global x, I had to use some sort of global here, keyword. But this x is another x defined in sub 2. So sub 2 define another x, the value is 10, and then it calls sub 1, okay? Static scope, okay? Static scope, which x will sub one display here? The global, right? Riley, Riley got it right. You understand that it's the global? Because uh, x is not defined in sub one, right? So static scope will look which scope encompass the sub one scope. The global one, right? The global one is the large scope that involves the sub one scope. And it defines x, and the value of x is 5. So the value B that will be printed out in the first option is 5. Let's evaluate the same program. Okay, so the value is going to be 5. Now let's evaluate the same program using dynamic scope. Okay. So in dynamic scope, we have X is 5, and this is, I'm going to call this the global or the main. Okay. And then sub 2 is called. So sub 2 was called from main. Sub 2, sub two define X and assign 10 to X. And then, so this is sub 2. Sub 2 calls sub 1. And sub one wants to print the value of x. So, because it's dynamic scope, right? I don't know if you guys can see it, right? 
sub 1 uh, was called by sub 2 because the dynamic scope, the value that's going to be used is 10. Okay? You see the difference? Right. Um, almost sounds like dynamic scope gets rid of the need for parameters. You just use the same variable. You get rid of what? Like, um, you don't need a parameter when you use dynamic scoping. You, you can use the, 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 that's interesting. Uh, you, you basically, because you inherit the, the all the variables defined with the function that call, you kind of use that information to communicate parameters, right? That's a interesting um, idea of using the dynamic scope to communicate values between functions because I know that this function here, if it's called from this one, I can use all the context defined within that function to be communicated for all the other functions called from that function. It's almost like the context is passed along, right? Here's my context, right? Interesting. So pros and cons, uh, static is easier to read. Uh, you can evaluate uh, just by reading the code. Um, uh, it's more uh, reliable. Uh, dynamic scope uh, has this ability to communicate values within function calls. Maybe you, you don't need to make uh, pass parameters or pass arguments to other functions, uh, but it's harder to read uh, and more complex to understand. So let's, uh, why don't you guys, oh, we can start, let's do the first three and then I'll let you guys uh, do the others. Let's do the first three together. Uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm just going to do the first one just to set the standard and then you guys can continue. I'll give you time to finish. But uh, you have to assume dynamic scoping uh, and this is the order of So include with each visible variable the name of the unit where it is declared. So because you have main calling sub one, sub one, sub two, sub two, sub three, we're we're going to evaluate the content, the, the visibility of variables at sub three, which is the last function call. Okay. So let's look at sub three. So gonna just write the functions, the, the sorry, the variable names. We have A, B, X, Y, B, X, Y, C, W, right? Okay, so we have all these functions. So let's look at, for example, A, we can Assume that the context here was sub three, right? X, you can do the same for X, and the same for W. Uh, so sub three was called by sub two, right? Sub two. So we learn which variable we learn here. B and Z, right? So we can put sub two here and Z sub two. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then sub two was called by sub one. Find anything else? Y. Okay. Y. 
So y was one from sub one. Okay. So that's the. This is what I want you to do. Figure it out. Uh, the context where each of the variables were learned, and always look at the last function call and go from there from right to left until you're able to determine all the variables that are visible and learn from the last context. Okay? Why don't you guys continue on the others? Maybe I should put get dynamic scoping mouse. <laughs> I think you could just make it five. It needs, to be, it needs to be like 25 points on its own.
He's asking if it's like visible or anything. Oh, okay. So I'm guessing whatever. It's too far. Is that Understand? Yeah. So sub three AXW, right? Now sub sub three is being called by sub one. Sub one. So you can learn y and z, right? Sub one has been called by main. Main. Yeah. Main does not define b. B is only defined in sub two. So two is not involved here. What should we do? What should we do? This one here, we start with sub one. A, Y, and Z. Sub three calls sub one. So X and W. Sub two calls sub two, sub three, and that's the B, right? Okay. Easy, right? You just need to attention to detail. How about you do these uh, last three as homework? Okay. 
So I'm going to assign B, D, and F as your next one. But if you're done, you're done. Right? Awesome. You don't have to do anything. Okay. Uh, Let's at least uh, start the ten here. So, um, we were focusing on variables naming and variables binding. Uh, we talked about type binding. So, let's focus more on data types um, collection of data values, set of operations on those values, uh, programming language. Uh, they must, they should support at least a basic set of types, special, especially numeric types, character strings, right? Booleans are also uh, part of the basic set of types. We provide mechanisms that allows allow the creation of user-defined data types, so you can create your own types. Uh, you can classify data types in scalar types or structure comp compound types. Uh, scalar types will hold only one piece of information at a time. Because basic ones are scalar like ints, float, boolean. It's always that thing, right? Uh, because if you, yeah, we, we're talking about the, the, the types, right? So, uh, so if you define an int, it's, it's open to interpretation because you can say, okay, if I define a class type, The object, the, the, the thing that we're modeling is definitely structure, right? Uh, or, sorry, uh, a structure as in compound. You can create a structure definition, right? Like a record, right? Of things. Or a collection of things. Uh, but if you look at the reference uh, type, the value itself is just a memory address, right? Which is, you can think of, that's a single value, right? It's the memory address. But let's think at a higher level of abstraction. We call structure type, we're including classes. Uh, we're just saying that uh, the thing that is represented is structure. So, Primitive types are those that come with the language. So we take primitive types. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, built-in types would be the ones that come with the language. Uh, so primitives, uh, in the sense that they are not defined in terms of other types. Uh, usually, primitive types are also built-in types uh, because those are provided usually for efficiency uh, um, so you can have uh, arithmetical operations uh, implemented efficiently uh, they usually those types map to the uh, system provided types depending on your platform uh, but the programming language 
they usually provide a mechanism for you to create your own types. Well, let's take a look at the primitive data types that are usually become in most programming language. So we're talking about integers. As I mentioned, the, those are usually directly supported by the hardware. Uh, but also depending on your the fact that it's supported by the hardware also limits what your uh, representation right so for some specific applications those primitive types will not be uh, sufficient because you are limited by what your platform provides. Uh, so for some for some uh, applications that, for example, that require very long integers, right? So you will have to use uh, uh, the, the primitive types will not be uh, sufficient, right? So, so some applications require super large integers that are beyond what the platform provides uh, uh, natively. So you have to use uh, Java, for example, has a good support for large integers. I think it's called big integer class. It's a package that you can add to Java library and you can start doing computations that require uh, special uh, size integers. Floating points, uh, again, rely heavily on representation supported by the hardware, usually is this IEEE 7, uh, 754. You guys probably studied that in 1400, right? Are you missing? All these things, Matissa, exponent, do you remember that? Not even slightly. Mm -hmm. We have to do it all over again in numerical analysis. Oh. Shell shocked. I like with a lot more differential equations. <laughs> Did you study all the bit uh, level representation of zeros? Yes. There are more than one, right? If I remember. Can I do that? And, like the uh, double precision or the single precision? Yeah, but uh, I think if uh, there are more than one way to represent zero in this uh, standard, uh, and then you can use those. I mean, I taught, I taught only once this uh, uh, computer organization. It was just first semester when I went to Pennsylvania. Uh, usually, when you move to another university, you start you don't you don't get to pick the course you teach. So that that was the course no one, no one wanted to teach there. And here, computer art, professor, I had to kind of review stuff that I studied in the in undergrad. And, uh, yeah, we. We looked at, remember when I thought that we actually saw some bit, we actually saw the bit level representation of some numbers. And when you do those operations uh, in floating point where divide and multiply by the same number, and you end up with something that is not what you had in the beginning, and you try to do floating point comparisons. That's when you see that you can't compare floating points by equality uh, because of those uh, errors you get because the representation has limitations, right? Uh, so that's when I had my students using C and they do did uh, a bitwise shift so they can actually see the bits of the number and they can compare. Uh, what's going on behind the scenes. That usually, uh, that, that's what I did when I taught that. I don't know if you guys did anything similar that you guys did. But it was 
quite interesting to see those things at the low level. Uh, but for example, there are some programming languages that uh, support other types for real numbers, like the decimal type, for example, so COBOL. Uh, this is because of the uh, goal of COBOL is to represent currency. And when you have these uh, floating point uh, arrows, uh, with the representation, because of the representation, that can create a problem when you are doing financial applications. So a specific COBOL and SQL, for example, and other languages that are more business oriented, they have uh, special types to represent currency. And you can use the decimal type. Uh, it's not the most efficient way to represent real numbers, but it's the best way for currency and applications that involve money. They uh, use more storage compared to floating points. Uh, Boolean types. Uh, C, for example, didn't have a uh, Boolean type until its 89th uh, nine version. So zero was false. Anything different than zero was considered true. So again, that something that uh, affects uh, how you read the program, right? Of course, you get used to, but uh, if you're not familiar with this representation, you may assume things that are not quite right. Okay, so we finish primitives. Why don't we continue uh, this next time? I think it's a good point to stop. You guys enjoy your weekend and I'll be able to look at the macro. Maybe not. Maybe not.